Okay, this is the House Healthcare Committee. It's Thursday, April 1st, it's 3 p.m. And this afternoon we are, we've invited the Commissioner of Public Safety and the Department of Mental Health, and we see we have a Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox with us to follow up on uh, the issue of mental health uh, practitioners are being embedded in law enforcement, uh, specifically the state police. It was an issue that this committee dealt with at the end of last session. And uh, many of us felt that it would be useful to get an update as to where the process was of the Department of Public Safety and the Department of Mental Health uh, working to bring this about. Uh, perhaps, and I, I, I don't have any, uh, well, I don't have any preference as to who speaks first, but uh, perhaps someone could first, for, we, have, we have a number of new members of the committee who were not party to the discussions we had last year. Uh, perhaps Commissioner Sherling, would you be willing to give a brief uh, summary of the proposal that came forward and, and what we are looking to get an update on? And you're on mute. Certainly. Uh, now, well, unmuted. Well, let's start uh, with welcome. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks for having us in. Uh, happy to do a, um, an overview of how we got to this point, and then uh, probably uh, kick it over to the deputy commissioner to walk you through, uh, since he's been very closely uh, involved in the, the program development here, uh, to give you the status update on this particular initiative. Um, so for the record, uh, Michael Sherling, commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. Um, there are, uh, the, the genesis of this particular kind of work goes back more than 20 years. Uh, the first embedded social worker in Vermont was in Bellows Falls. Um, shortly after that, uh, the city of Burlington began a partnership with the Howard Center to deploy uh, what at the time was one uh, mental health clinician on the Church Street Marketplace to help mitigate the ongoing impact of um, of and to uh, folks that suffered from uh, mental illness, substance abuse, often co-occurring disorders, um, and a variety of other unmet social service needs um, as they um, intersected the businesses and folks that uh, frequented the what is arguably the busiest street uh, in, uh, in Vermont in the Church Street Marketplace. That was a very successful program that um, provided great service to folks that were that suffered from a variety of needs uh, and simultaneously decreased the number of contacts with law enforcement um, and eventually uh, rides to the emergency room, uh, intersections with the mental health system, et cetera. Those programs have since grown up in a variety of different ways, including two teams that have grown to cover uh, both Burlington and Chittenden County uh, and not only uh, doing sort of day-to-day -day outreach in particular geographic areas, but doing a variety of things, including uh, proactive outreach to people who have um, made it to the radar of either the, the healthcare or criminal justice systems and have uh, unmet needs and are uh, not actively engaging otherwise with services. Uh, responding sometimes with law enforcement and other first responders to include um, fire departments and rescue squads, um, and in other instances responding in lieu of uh, those first response organizations to calls for service that originate with people who are um, suffering from one or more of the various co-occurring disorders that I mentioned. In addition to those initiatives, there are others scattered around Vermont, including two pilot projects that have been in place now for several years in two barracks in both Westminster and St. Albans. Uh, by all accounts, these initiatives have been successful through the lens of um, the clients who are getting services from these folks, from the first response agencies that are partnered with them, uh, from emergency departments and healthcare providers in the vicinity, and we've done a variety of uh, both formal and informal studies. The last formal study that I'm aware of was actually done by Doug Hoffer when he was at the University of Vermont um, at the request of the Burlington Police Department when I was there. And, and his uh, review of the street outreach team at the time indicated that there were decreases in calls for service 
for folks that were the most frequent users of services, uh, not only to, uh, to law enforcement agencies, the fire department and the rescue squad, uh, visits to the emergency department, intersections with the court and the criminal justice system in a formal way, uh, and a, a host of other um, decreases in service that were uh, a result of the success of these, um, these outreach and response initiatives. What we put forward last year was a, uh, a request for funding to expand the programs that exist in the two barracks that I mentioned, Westminster and St. Albans, to uh, six additional barracks to have a total of eight barracks covered. And this year we put forward funding to uh, expand that to nine out of the 10 barracks. Um, and it, essentially to replicate the work that's being done in those two barracks and in other places uh, statewide and to try to create a unified um, system of response where uh, we send folks with expertise in um, mental health, uh, substance abuse and other um, uh, social service provision. Oftentimes, again, in lieu of the response of law enforcement, sometimes in, in combination with law enforcement, uh, and to not only address the, the intersections with the criminal justice system, but with a wide array of, of other systems as well. Um, that was funded uh, last year, and the work began in early November. Uh, if you remember, the, the, uh, the session was a little fragmented by the time things were signed into law. It was October of last year. Uh, and uh, so work began in November um, together with the Department of Mental Health. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Fox has taken a lead role in uh, developing these uh, programmatic uh, initiatives and uh, in partnership with the designated agencies and a variety of stakeholders to develop a statewide memorandum of understanding and then a hiring rubric for these folks. And that's the, the stage we're at now. And, um, I'll stop there for any historic questions and also to turn it over to the deputy commissioner for the, the current um, status. Thank you. Uh, and let me just say, let me just step in and say, because some of our members uh, rightly asked, like when we take bring folks in to testify, well, are we about to take an action? Do we need to think about taking an action? This is not an action item this afternoon. This is for information and follow up on work that we did take action on last year. So just to clarify that as well. Um, so there may be issues of information and clarification. I've welcomed them along the way. But why don't we turn to Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox. Welcome back. Uh, Thank you very much. Us more, you know, some further update on where things stand and then we'll open it up for further questions. No, for the record, uh, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Uh, as Commissioner Shirley mentioned, uh, this work uh, in earnest began in uh, November of last year. And over the course of the last six months, we've had a uh, rather extensive uh, stakeholder engagement process uh, to really build from the ground up a uh, memorandum of understanding uh, that would be uh, used statewide uh, that can be used by every designated agency and their local barracks uh, so that there's fidelity and consistency around expectations uh, of this work and, and the work being provided by the mental health crisis specialists. That's the, the term that we're currently using uh, for these folks uh, and that we did not want to uh, use language such as embedded social worker or counselor or something of that sort. Uh, partly because we didn't want to box ourselves into uh, the need for uh, licensed individuals of any particular uh, practice and also that uh, folks with lived experience uh, and more practical uh, experiences as opposed to uh, book learning and other education backgrounds uh, that it would be open to any of those folks that would be appropriate to, to make that work. Uh, uh, in, in, these, in these settings. And so we engaged with uh, the designated agencies, the statewide uh, state program standing committee, local standing committees throughout the state, as well as Vermont Psychiatric Survivors, NAMI, uh, different commissions uh, related to uh, domestic violence, uh, uh, victim crime uh, uh, supports, uh, 
as well as uh, the uh, director of racial equity um, uh, in the governor's uh, office. And so through that, that process, uh, it's taken us a bit longer than I think we would have liked to have gotten at this point, just but it's been an extensive back and forth conversation around uh, the details of the MOU, uh, the details of the actual job description, and as Commissioner Sherling said, uh, the kind of onboarding and training uh, of, of these folks. Again, wanting to try to ensure as best as possible that there's fidelity uh, across the state in, in all this work. Uh, we are at the place now, uh, it's actually good timing that, that you asked for this update. Uh, as last week, the memorandum of understanding has gone through uh, its kind of final processes uh, to be signed off on. Uh, it's gone through the, the lens of the, not only the, the people who may be providing services or supervising these services, both from the Department of Public Safety and the designated agencies, but also uh, from a legal perspective, uh, both the general counsels for Department of Public Safety, Department of Mental Health, and through Vermont Care Partners uh, to basically make sure that everyone was in agreement in the context of uh, the memorandum of understanding and responsibilities, supervision, uh, things of that sort as well. So we are now at a final stage of finally having all these documents finalized uh, and, and consistent. And so it's now, uh, in fact, Commissioner Shirley and I spoke earlier uh, today to just start coming up with the process of now rolling it out, bringing the designated agencies together with the barracks and really rolling out the uh, hiring process uh, and getting that started uh, in the coming weeks. Okay. Uh, so just let me just ask several things and then open it up to other members. Sure. Um, so is it, it's so remind us, uh, it is the intention that these folks would be hired uh, through a through what process? Uh, who 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 would who would be doing the hiring? They, uh, as I remember, commissioner, they would be employees of the Department of Public Safety. Am I correct? They actually, would no? actually be uh, employees of the designated agencies, in part because we want to <laughs> ensure you. the correct right. clinical supervision through the folks that have that expertise. Um, and I'm uh, being reminded because I he said there were it, different iterations going around. Yep, there were. Um, and uh, we envision a, a collaborative hiring process where ultimately the designated agency is doing the hiring, but that there are stakeholders uh, and representatives from the Department of uh, Mental Health and the Department of Public Safety as part of that hiring process. And one of the things we spoke about this morning was ensuring that there was consistency statewide. We don't create 10 different hiring processes around the state. We try to do it in a way that uh, creates, um, while working for different agencies, a, a unified uh, program to the greatest extent possible. And just to add to that, I think part of that hiring process, what we're looking at is that, um, as Commissioner said, the, the, the final decision is that it's going to be a decision on the designate agency. They'll be the one that's employing uh, the individuals, uh, but it will be a collaborative process with representatives from Department of Public Safety, the designated agency, uh, people with lived experience, uh, as well as some of the members uh, of, the, of the small committee that help put, put all these pieces together uh, so that we have kind of a consistent hiring uh, throughout the state. Uh, well, let me, uh, let's just open it up to further questions at this point. Um, I see several hands, uh, Representative Peterson and Representative Burroughs. Yes, thank you. Um, the, the folks you're hiring, and I, and I may have gotten this way wrong, I'm trying to follow all that was said here. The folks that you're hiring are going to deploy with law enforcement to be a, a mental health advocate and to diffuse situations um, and, and work with law enforcement uh, it, 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 everywhere. Is, is that what the ultimate goal is, that every, every barracks, every group, every, um, is it the ultimate goal that every uh, every time an officer leaves 
uh, on a patrol or anything that that person would go with them or are they in the in the barracks for a call out should something happen how how will that that's one question the other question i have is uh, you you talk about folks with lived experience are they going to be possibly hired for this also those are the two questions i have I'll start with the answer to the first question and actually give you a number of fragments of information uh, in response to that. Um, the, the, in terms of the service area, we envision that it will be statewide eventually um, once we have all the barracks covered and it won't only be uh, servicing the service area that the barracks covers. So for example, out of the Rutland barracks, if there was a call in Brandon, uh, even though the Brandon Police Department covers that area, this, uh, these, this staff would be available outside of the, uh, the, the service area of the barracks as well. In terms of where they deploy from, in some instances, they'll be coming from the barracks. They may be there doing uh, meetings or gathering information. Uh, they may be responding from another location. Uh, they may be responding to calls with uh, a, a trooper or another police officer. They may be responding to a call in lieu of that uh, the response by a law enforcement officer, and they may be out doing proactive um, contact with clients to prevent calls from service from happening. So there may be other uh, sort of operational methodologies that I haven't covered there, but uh, gives you a sense of sort of the, the wide scope of things they might be doing. Um, in addition to that, uh, in an ideal world, um, Oh, let me back up to a, one more piece of history that I, uh, that I skipped over. <clears throat> Many communities have wanted to do this kind of expansion of service for years. And oftentimes it has faced uh, stagnation because we're waiting for uh, a partner or waiting for the state or waiting for someone to come forward with a fragment of funding to be able to make this all work. We finally said last year, listen, well, the ideal scenario is that you've got multiple partners helping to fund this kind of initiative because there's a benefit to a wide array of stakeholders. Let's just start by the seed funding coming from the state. Let's get the program up and running, and then we will go out and continue to hopefully expand. Right now, remember, we're, we're contemplating just one employee that covers each of the various barracks areas. That's my and other question, okay. It's, it, it, we have multiple shifts. You might need multiple people per shift. Um, you know, we're gonna get a lot more experience uh, with a statewide footprint as this gets off the ground. And the hope is that we partner with hospitals, with designated agencies, with other healthcare providers, with other first response organizations, maybe with statewide organizations like One Care or others all to bring collaborative funding to the table to expand the footprint uh, based on the efficacy that we demonstrate going forward. And on the, uh, on the um, second half of the question, um, I'll defer to the, the deputy commissioner. Yeah, and uh, just to, to follow up on some of that, some of the uh, activities of, of these individuals as uh, the commissioner was speaking about um, the response, uh, you know, coming from the barracks or other locations, they're also their responses may be going out as follow-ups to prior contacts um, and trying to help. I think the primary goal is to really try to help individuals be connected to the, the social service supports that, that they need uh, and not uh, and try to minimize and reduce contacts with law enforcement um, or uh, other you know, unnecessary emergency room visits, things of that sort, and trying to get them connected with the social service supports that that they would need. Um, uh, Representative Peterson, the second half of your question, can you just repeat that again? I just wanna make sure I answer it correctly. What I wanted to know is, you, you mentioned uh, people with lived experience. Yeah. And, and I, my, my question is, what uh, training have those, in, in other words, are you yeah. just getting someone with lived experience? You're gonna send them out there to deal with people and they don't know how to, I assume you're not gonna, but. I, I want to know where education and training sure. and, and lived experience kind of go together. Sure. Um, it is a distinct possibility that we'd be hiring individuals with uh, 
uh, lived experience and without an advanced degree in, in mental health. Uh, the, the job description actually, uh, we set a standard of having uh, a, an associate's degree um, as uh, a level of education. Uh, the folks doing this work will not be uh, billing individuals, uh, will not be billing Medicaid, uh, things of that sort. Uh, generally in kind of crisis type response uh, where you're not seeking you know, insurance information of individuals, things of that sort. And from the research that, that, that we've done, uh, it really seems to indicate that it's more around the right person with the right attitudes, the right mentality, the, the right uh, communication styles uh, to, to be able to be effective in this type of role versus having X, Y, or Z degree or licensure after your name. Uh, and so what we'll be looking for in individuals is just, just that, uh, their, their ability and comfort levels in, in working in an environment where you're working with law enforcement on a regular basis uh, and being able to receive uh, supervision and support from the designated agency. Uh, and so it's, it's possible that we'll be hiring individuals who do not come in with you know, a license or you know, advanced degree. Uh, it's very possible that we will be hiring many individuals with licenses and, and advanced degrees. Uh, it's really based on uh, compatibility and ability to uh, make those connections with individuals uh, in the moment of a crisis. Uh, the idea is that these individuals are not providing therapy uh, for an individual. They're really there to try and help manage a crisis and, and help get individuals connected with the social service supports that, that, that they need that, that are at the root of uh, the cause of, of that crisis for that day. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Burroughs. Thank you. I, I just first want to say that uh, I, I commend you both and all of you who, who are standing invisibly next to you um, for this program. This is really exciting and I can't wait to see where it goes. Um, Commissioner Sherling, you, you mentioned that you were shooting for nine out of 10 barracks and I wondered what, what happened to the other one that got, is getting left out. Who got the last straw? Yeah. We, uh, and where well, are they? Gonna, where where are they anyway? Why? Probably in the not. northeast kingdom. We, you haven't asked <laughs> for parts. <laughs> well, I, 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 I didn't need to ask. Sorry. No, it's a it's a great question. We haven't actually left anyone out, and and uh, we've had um, a number of conversations with the money committees this year, telegraphing to them what our tentative plan is. Uh, we actually have two things that we're going to solve for. One is um, that initially the uh, funding was for really seven of the 10 because the two that exist already, Westminster and St. Albans, are funded exclusively by the designated agency. So we knew going into this, we were creating an unlevel um, and an unequal playing field for those uh, DAs. So what our plan is, and not to drag you too far into the money, but what we've telegraphed is because we are so far into this budget uh, cycle, the, the hope is that we will plan um, for uh, funding all 10 barracks going forward for, for this year. We will then ask to carry forward some of the money that was appropriated from this year into the coming fiscal year, still be able to fund all 10. And then in fiscal 23, come back to you with what we anticipate would be a roughly $200,000 uh, additional funding request uh, to sustain the funding for all 10. So in fact, the plan, I, I had heard, I mean, I under, had understood that in fact, there were all 10 barracks were going to be covered in the budget as proposed. Yes, it was inadvertent. Um, we, that wasn't, it wasn't by design, but by happenstance because of the timing of all of this, right. uh, it's worked out that way. So <laughs> it's, it's positive. It's a silver lining to the, to the yeah. timeline. The carry forward creates the opportunity. Um, okay, so uh, well, Representative Page. Uh, so it sounds like there might be someone in the Northeast Kingdom. 
Yes, but apart, but apart from that, you have another question, perhaps. Well, I do, and I apologize. I came in late, and uh, maybe you've already answered this question. What are the salaries for these individuals that are going to be assisting? Uh, the starting um, all in is estimated in the low 80s, um, including benefit package. So I, I don't know how much of that is benefits versus salary, but based on the engagement with the designated agencies, we're anticipating um, in the low 80s. And, and that is also uh, an adjustment from our initial funding request, which was at 75 uh, for each position. So that, that's something we'll address also going into to fiscal 23. Well, that's, that's much better than I thought you were going to say, um, you know, for a salary. Um, that's not all salary. Just let's be really well, clear. Yeah. <laughs> be really yeah. clear. That, that's better than what I thought. talk about is benefits. Yeah. If, if I were to guess it's in the, you know, low to mid fifties and the rest of it is, uh, his benefits, but that's a that's a guess, and maybe the deputy commissioner has a better sense of that at this stage. I don't know. Yeah, and we we actually engage with the designated agencies, and in, in particular those that are already uh, have these these positions in place, um, and uh, and that's the the salary range and and total total salary package, including benefits. Uh, of those current individuals, and so we wanted to remain consistent with uh, with those folks, and did not want to come in uh, at a lower uh, range than than where folks are currently at. Okay, and um, I would imagine you're going to find it difficult to find these individuals. From you know, since we're we do have a manpower issue on almost everything in the state. And I will also remind you, well, we all know it because we've been talking about it. Um, these individuals will be state workers, I'm assuming? No. They're not, okay. Very good then. Thank you yeah, very much. <laughs> we're also mindful of the pressures on the state budget relative to adding uh, people, but the primary reason is the, the clinical supervision component. Yeah. Okay. You're Questions answered, Representative Page? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, Representative Goldman? Well, I'm glad we brought that topic up because, and thank you to both of you. It sounds like a really excellent program and really good for our population, but, oops, my dog. Um, but we also have been talking a lot about how designated agencies haven't gotten raises. Um, it's really hard to, like you said, Representative Page, to find staff. So I feel worried about adding more staff at that level and then not funding it. I know you funded for a couple of years, but what happens after that? Um, so I guess I feel worried about the model of adding staff to designated agencies and not having them be supported in, um, in a state position. I understand about pressures on the state budget as well, but I mean, we can't every so often say we want to add 2% to designated agencies and that's what we've had to do this year. So I'm a little, I'm, I'm concerned and I'm concerned about the ongoing sustainability of this because of that problem. Well, there are, uh, there's two advantages to what we've done in the initial funding. Uh, first to begin, it is in our base budget in the Department of Public Safety. So it doesn't just go for two years. Um, the goal is to sustain this for the long term. And again, to expand it through partnerships going forward in the future. Uh, the advantage to it being budgeted using state dollars is that uh, in, as the salaries grow over time, so if we're able to um, retain people, they do get uh, steps in cost of living uh, in much the same way the state workers do. Um, we would be coming back to you on an annualized basis to. Uh, to show those uh, salary increases as part of our base budget since the money is passing through us. So there's a, an advantage in the consistency of funding um, with a program that's being co-managed between uh, the Department of Public Safety and the Department of Mental Health. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Representative Black and then Representative Donahue. Thank you, and thank you, Commissioner Sherling. I, I, first of all, I think this is very exciting. Um, I can't wait to see how how things turn out. Um, my question is: Are will these individuals receive 
even cursory training in law enforcement? They I mean, will. They will get uh, their safety. They'll get safety training. They'll get safety briefings. Um, we haven't yet discussed uh, equipment, but I know um, in Burlington, the street outreach team actually has radios so that they can both radio for help if they needed it, but they can also listen to calls for service and actively intervene if they hear something that maybe they're not dispatched to, but uh, is a client that they're aware of and they may have something to offer, they can respond. So um, my hope is that we're, we will eventually be doing something similar to that as well. And I would just, I would just add that as part of the onboarding and training, uh, there's a number of different trainings, including uh, different law enforcement trainings around sea management, safety management, things of that sort. Uh, as well as uh, uh, intentional peer support uh, trainings, team two training, uh, things like things of those nature as well, as well as uh, even radio training as, as the commissioner mentioned uh, and understanding the, the computer systems of both the designated agency as well as uh, the computer systems that Department of Public Safety uses. Uh, so it's a, it's a relatively extensive actually uh, training uh, regimen that's that's really set up uh, for all the individuals. Is there any concern about, you know, sort of overlapping or, you know, after a sick period of time becoming more embedded as a law enforcement officer as opposed to, you know, the original intent of the position? Is there that's a it's a great question. And, you know, luckily we've got two decades of experience with this now. Um, and we haven't seen that happen. Um, they're very much distinct roles. And um, if anything, I think what you see is that the, uh, the, the clinical uh, approach um, sort of uh, morphs its way more into the officers who are learning from the clinicians that they're responding with. Um, and those skill sets sort of bleed over um, in a really positive way and, and not so much the other way around. And I, I would just add and, um, that, you know, my guess is Commissioner Sherling would, will probably agree with me that I think in a lot of cases, many officers and troopers are hesitant or reluctant or concerned about having uh, a quote unquote civilian uh, responding and, and coming out. But the experience has been both in the barracks where this is, is occurring as well as in other places like the community outreach team and uh, that type of work in Burlington is that we're actually seeing the other impact where they're having that positive influence on the, the law enforcement officers and they're seeing the value of uh, kind of that, that more clinical intervention and the skills used uh, there. Um, and I think it's part of, part of this work is also to try to kind of cross pollinate and really create moments of opportunity um, that uh, what I call growth points uh, where individuals can see and experience and then there's kind of on on the job training and education and so it's not just that these these clinicians or these specialists are are going to be trained into law enforcement but that law enforcement also receives kind of that that informal training of oh so what was how did you get that you know person that conversation it's like well that's the motivational interviewing that I was using well that's a really interesting concept how, how does that work and that's some of that cross pollination that that uh, we've seen in other places that we would expect to continue to see. Again, I'm very excited. I know, um, you know, the local police department in my town and Representative Houghton's town, I, we share one with surrounding communities. And I've heard the chief talk about if we could have our own individual, yep. it would make a world of difference. Yep. Yeah, to that point, uh, what we hear most frequently is uh, troopers and police officers asking for more uh, of this kind of staff. Uh, as many as we can deliver, they'll take them. Okay, uh, thank you. Representative Donahue. Thank you. Um, I, I realize that a lot of the MOU um, sure has to do with how, do the, how does the money run? How does the supervision run? Uh, I'm wondering, um, 
how much is involved in it in talking about um, who responds, how are responses handled, what's the relationship like, and if there's any examples of things like that that you can share. I think, Commissioner, if that's all right, I'll, I'll Angie, you can go. Sure. Um, but I think one of the major pieces of the of the MOU actually speaks to um, when that co-response happens, who's taking the lead, how is that happening, things of that sort. And we tried not to get this to be too complex of a, of a document and try and go into each and every scenario. But the basic concept that, that we tried to get across in the MOU is that if there's any kind of clinical decision making, uh, I think this person needs X, I think this person needs Y, that the crisis specialist, that's, that's their purview and that's their decision making uh, tree. There'll be, in, there'll be a discussion, there'll be conversations, but in the end, the, the, the specialist uh, kind of runs that. Uh, if there's questions around scene safety, uh, you know, is there a weapon involved or something of that sort, that's law enforcement that, that will take kind of the lead in, in those circumstances. And so that's really how we try to, to divvy that out. Uh, but, you know, we definitely took a, a strong look at that uh, because I think we want to make sure that when it's coming down to, you know, I'll give an example. I think this person can follow up with, you know, uh, we can have the crisis team give them a call later to follow up and we'll get them connected with, you know, a therapist or intake at X designated agency. And the officer may say, I don't think so. I think they need to be in the hospital, you know, that kind of thing, that it's the specialist that's going to make that final decision uh, versus the, the safety situation with the crisis specialist. I, I'm okay, I can go in. No, law enforcement may say, we know that there might be weapons here. We need to make sure the scene is safe first. And so they'll take that, that lead at that point. But that's, that's the type of, of language that we have in the MOU. What, what about, um, you know, a 911 call comes in? How is that screened in terms of whether it's going to be both or one or the other who responds? Um, it could be screened a number of different ways, but uh, the uh, my experience has been, you know, the, the MOU is most applicable in the first three to four months. And after that, there is just a flow to how all this works. And it really is a team that is firing on all cylinders and um, folks know who's best suited to do various things. Um, and if anything, these, the, the, the folks that we're going to hire are, their phone is going to be ringing, you know, three months in, it's going to be ringing constantly, both with clients who are calling directly, people calling dispatch, asking for them, and our staff calling and asking for their advice or asking for their help or asking them to respond to things. So performance punishment comes in pretty quickly. Um, uh, so the, the, you know, we could script a variety of those different flows, but it really does come down to common sense and everybody listening to the calls that are happening. And that's why having them uh, on the radio and present and able to intercede um, when they hear something going on or to call off a response to say, listen, you know, you're sending me to go see John Smith. I was there yesterday. He was not really in a good way and he was threatening me at the time. So why don't we send uh, a trooper or a police officer first and I'll, I'll wait and, uh, and if he's calm, then I'll go in and talk to him. Um, it all just, it, it kind of flows based on that, that common sense uh, rubric uh, once things start moving. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna just throw out a question here. The, the, frankly, it seems to me that individuals who are willing to step into these types of roles bring a particular special set of personal qualities and willingness to step into crisis situations, et cetera. And uh, so I, and I know that's what you'll be, you know, assessing for and looking for in hiring. It seems like there might also be particular opportunities to have these folks uh, connect with each other across the state. That they're not, so that they're not learning and doing this in particular isolation as, a part, as opposed to just the individual supervision or you know, whatever type of supervision is set up at each DA. Uh, so I, I'm wondering if, you, if that's being contemplated and hoping that it is actually. Uh, it is, and not just connecting. Particular, particular uh, 
there might be particular value to having them have peers, if you will. Mm -hmm. I think that's exactly right. And, and we've had those active conversations already and not just connecting the, the 10 folks that will work in this, in the bubble of this program, but having them connected to the folks doing similar work all over the state. So we're really trying to create um, uh, an array of assets that can leverage each other's experience, each other's talents, training um, to provide better service and leverage each other's experience going forward. Yeah, and we actually, uh, I don't have it right in front of me, but I, I believe it's actually spelled out uh, in one of the documents that we'd be looking at a monthly uh, kind of peer supervision uh, with these folks. Uh, again, to share their experiences um, and, and what they've learned uh, through their experiences so that others can learn from that as opposed to having to learn it for themselves um, in the moment of a crisis. Um, so no, you're exactly right, uh, uh, Representative Lippert, that uh, having that, that space is, is really important. And so we actually look at that as not only the, the direct supervision from the emergency service director at the designated agency, but also uh, uh, regularly scheduled uh, peer supervision uh, meetings as well. Uh, Representative Peterson, perhaps, and then Representative Goldman. Yes, um, yeah, you probably mentioned this along the way here, but how long is the training period for these folks? What do we envision as a training period? I assume they're, you know, you mentioned all the things you're going to want to train them on. What are we talking? Uh, I don't know if there's been a timeline developed yet. I'd ask the Deputy, Commi uh, Deputy Commissioner if they have a timeline. Um, I, I could take a shot at, you know, uh, ballparking it, but they may have a timeline already built. Yeah, we, we don't have a specific timeline. I think part of it is coordinating all the different trainings. Uh, as there are some specific uh, prescribed trainings, uh, as well as uh, things that can be trained kind of on the job uh, type training um, and such like that. Uh, but we haven't, there isn't a, a schedule um, for that as, as delineated in any of our documents yet. Commissioner Sherling, uh, what's the training period for a state trooper? <laughs> uh, it's pretty close to a year um, from okay. pre-basic through field training. Okay. Uh, we don't envision anything close to that, you know, as, assuming a no, base I level understand. is coming in. Yeah. I understand, but I, I you know, I, I maybe I'm looking at the negative here, but, you know, I hate to put in a, a person with limited training in a, in a bad situation. That's all. I, I assume you're going to pair up if there's any question. That's exactly right. And, and one of the jobs of the, the supervisor on duty for the particular barracks is to ensure that we're not placing clinicians in, uh, in bad circumstances, much like we don't want to put a trooper in a bad circumstance yeah. alone either, but uh, right. a little different, um, little different balancing act there. And and I would just add, similar to what Commissioner Sterling stated earlier, that you know, after a few months, kind of how the calls go and how they're rooted becomes kind of a, a well-oiled and just right. function thing. I right. think at you know the early outset, you'll see a lot more uh, co-responses, um, and then as comfort levels and and other things develop, uh, you'll start to then see more uh, separate uh, responses or you know, the clinicians responding to a radio call going, I know, you know, John Doe, I, I feel comfortable taking that, that call, you know, those types of things as well. Right, right. Okay, thank you. And even in the urban, uh, more urban, to the extent we have urban in Vermont, in the more urban environments where we have these folks operating, sometimes those uh, contacts are done by phone to assess, um, you know, what somebody's current state is. So the, the, um, the street outreach team member will call them and get an initial um, sort of weather report before they, they walk up to the door. Representative Golden, Representative Donahue. So it seems you almost have a natural experiment because there have been two um, barracks, St. Albans and Westminster with these people with many that don't have it. So do you have any data comparing like emergency room visits or anything that could sort of demonstrate the the outcomes of this program? 
I wish we did. We don't. Our current data system is uh, old and busted. Um, we are getting a new one where it's in progress right now, should be up and running by July. So perfect timing to begin um, looking at, uh, at the efficacy. Um, we do have that data from other departments uh, that have utilized uh, this kind of response. And it does show definitive um, differences in call volumes, especially with folks that are uh, more frequently in contact with the systems that I uh, described. Um, for, for folks that have, um, you know, there's a variety of different clients that, that people interact with. Sometimes it's just a, a one-time thing. Someone's in a crisis, uh, they need a crisis response, we never see them again. Um, but more frequently, there's a, a very small cross-section of people that tend to, to utilize services, whether that's emergency department or law enforcement or criminal justice system, um, in a in a very disproportionate way, and, and that's where a lot of the um, really successful interventions are in reducing excessive call volumes uh, by a, cross, a, a small cross-section of individuals to a much smaller level, and then moving on to the next sort of cohort of folks that, um, that could use services or have unmet needs and trying to address those. Um, the analogy is, um, if you've read uh, Malcolm Gladwell's Million Dollar Murray, it's, it's pretty old now, it was the 80s, he wrote a, a, an article around a, a gentleman who had a variety of needs in New York City and then assessed what the cost of a year's worth of services to that person was. And, and the moniker was Million Dollar Murray because even back in the 80s, he was consuming a million dollars plus in resources across healthcare systems, criminal justice services, et cetera. When we did an initial assessment, um, when we deployed the first citywide street outreach team in Burlington, um, we had a number of million dollar Murrays and they were able to successfully um, provide a level of service that those folks had not previously enjoyed. And as a result of that, going to them instead of relying on them keeping appointments as they suffered from various types of crises, um, their visits to the emergency department, their rides in the back of a police car, their rides in an ambulance all went down dramatically. So their quality of life improved, the cost of the various services um, improved, and it was just a, it, I, I can't overstate how, um, how useful in so many different ways these kinds of response initiatives are. So Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may follow up. Sure. I'm just wondering if in the if, if I'm not sure where the appropriate place would be, but it, would it be in the MOU or you say you're going towards collecting data? Have you talked about a process? Would it be in the MOU? Would it where would it live? Um, I know your data collection is all terrible, but I think in order to prove that this has value, I, I understand about million dollar Murray, you know, but it's anecdotal. So how do it we is. understand statewide the impact of this program? So we, the, 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 the components of the information technology system already exist because the system we chose is already in use in roughly 50% of the agencies in Vermont, including most of Chittenden County, which has been tracking this for some time. So uh, it's embedded in that system. So once we get to July, we will be able to um, much more clearly track the impact of uh, a variety of different kinds of social service needs and, and, and call types uh, and how they um, change over time based on uh, different kinds of strategies. And I would, I would just add in, in the MOU itself, uh, we, there are probably close to two dozen different data points uh, that will be collected, uh, everything from, age, uh, you know, kind of general demographic type information, where calls came in, nature of the call, mental health related, substance use related, other, you know, on down, uh, uh, you know, quite an extensive list of, of data because that's just it. You know, we know that we need to come back and show the efficacy of the program in order to be able to say, we want to keep getting funding and keep this a part of the base budget and, and such like that. Um, and so anecdotal data does not equate to, um, you know, the, uh, receiving funding. And so uh, we, that's baked into the MOU 
uh, the data points. And even though, as the commissioner said, we didn't have kind of that, the data to show the efficacy of the, the two kind of current uh, embedded workers, those workers were a part of this development of the MOU and, and working with us in the job description and the training based on what they went through, the, the good things that, that happened for them, the, the, the hiccups and hurdles and, and roadblocks that, that happened for them and you know so that we could basically pave the road for the next round of folks coming in uh, to have as good and even a better experience um, in, the, in the training and what data they're collecting and it's based off a lot of what data they're already uh, collecting and and uh, uh, and monitoring as well. Um, so, so one more question, if I may. Um, the two people that have been embedded, it sounds like they were for a long time. Um, do you have any sense of what the turnover is in that position? Uh, it's been about two years. I don't believe there's been turnover. Uh, I could be wrong, but I'm not aware of any turnover so far. No, I think uh, the worker out of Westminster I know has been there at least two or three years, and St. Albans as well has been there for several years, uh, and the only the only worker I've ever known there. Uh, okay, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Representative Donahue, Representative Peterson. Yes, thank you. I, I think. Um, the only thing that's um, that's a little bit uh, dispiriting about this is when you think back, if, if you um, imagine what most people thought and maybe once was the goals and vision and type of work that, um, that our crisis teams around the state were intended to do. And a lot of the description of this work is exactly what our, our crisis teams were envisioned of, as, and even in terms of uh, close working relationships um, with uh, law enforcement and being able to respond with them and assist um, was uh, what was called team two training to help make those communications work. And having attended some of them, I know one of the um, law enforcement responses to that was, gee, you know, great training about um, how to uh, reach out and get crisis team resp uh, response but they never respond because they're never available um, because they're either understaffed for you know, lack of um, being able to compensate or even more frequently simply tied up sitting in emergency rooms doing screening, which results in a lot of people not wanting to call them in a crisis because they know calling the crisis team means uh, being evaluated for whether you're gonna be involuntarily hospitalized. So. It, it sort of feels in a lot of ways like, um, you know, starting over with something that, that could have been there, but we, we didn't fund and didn't support and therefore has kind of been diverted. But um, the thing that started me uh, thinking about that, actually, thinking about it in terms of the kind of crisis team response function that they play is the fact that we just heard earlier today that... Um, that there's a whole batch of ARPA money specifically designated for uh, crisis team uh, bolstering. So I'm just wondering in terms of this model, if this is what we're, where we're going now with, with sustainable funding for crisis response, if that could, uh, could be a source for, for funding for um, expansion here. That's a great question. Uh, we haven't gotten that far into uh, exploring that particular funding option, but uh, as you observe, I remember responding in the late 80s and early 90s with the Howard Center's mobile crisis team and uh, you know, learned a lot about, uh, I guess to some extent, how to form these programs by, uh, by the work we did on the street way back then. Um, it, it, an, an interesting uh, sort of offshoot of the observation you made about people's willingness to call based on their perception of what might happen. We get, um, we get calls where people are requesting, in some cases, the street outreach worker by name. And in other instances, they're calling asking for particular police officers because for some reason they didn't like what the, uh, 
what the, uh, the the street outreach worker told them. So instead, they want to talk to Officer Smith, and they don't really want to talk to Justin, so they want to talk to him. So it, it, people begin to kind of shop for um, the service they want, which is fine because the goal is to get them to engage in the problem solving process. So either one is is actually a positive um, outcome. I, I did uh, I did uh, extensive street outreach in uh, New York City in the uh, in the eighties, so I'm very familiar with the that whole phenomenon. And I would, and you know, I I was at the Howard Center's uh, their mobile crisis team uh, in the mid nineties um, and. If a program like this existed, I would have jumped at that opportunity. Uh, was, I, that was back in the day when most of our outreaches were in the community, not to the emergency room, as as you see more often now. Um, and uh, um, you know, just to your to your point, Representative Donahue, around uh, concerns of of individuals because of uh, the concern of of how a responder may may respond, um, and you know, uh, we took particular note of that and made sure that uh, part of the the understanding is that these uh, crisis specialists uh, would receive the training that a qualified mental health professional receives for their understanding and knowledge of the laws, uh, but that they would not be designated as qualified mental health professionals uh, in that. We don't want that to be a barrier. We don't want people to think if if I am in contact with uh, these folks uh, with you know a mental health crisis specialist through through the police that they may seek to you know involuntarily hospitalize me. Um, it could, it maybe so, for yeah for background for new folks, wh what does that title mean? What's qualified mental health professional? Sure. So qual. Qualified mental health professional uh, are the individuals that uh, the department provides training for at the designated agencies. Uh, and it's a two year designation. Every two years, people would have to go through uh, the qualified mental health professional training. And it's all about uh, the laws around involuntary hospitalization. Uh, and basically with, with um, um, completion of that training, the individuals at the designated agencies and their emergency services would have the capacity to engage in the involuntary hospitalization process. They would generally do the, basically the first part of the emergency exam, uh, if you will, or the ability to uh, work with a judge to write a warrant uh, to bring someone to a hospital for an emergency exam uh, for, to commence the, the, the process for involuntary hospitalization. Well, this is uh, actually filled us in with a lot of information. Um, actually, I actually have one, one other question that occurs to me because very late, very, very late in the negotiations that resulted in this becoming law, domestic violence was added uh, very late in the negotiations. If you remember Commissioner Sherling, and we were all very late in the night doing this. Don't uh, go there. <laughs> well, I'm just saying. Uh, that is part of the statute now, and I did hear it referenced in the in the uh, in the uh, stakeholders' involvement. And so I'm I'm just interested to s to learn if there's anything to learn about the inclusion of that and what that might mean. I, I don't know that we've got a. Um, a specific lane of travel for that yet, uh, other than um, in that array of training that is uh, um, going to be important early on, uh, awareness training around um, how to recognize and uh, what the impacts of domestic violence are and uh, how uh, someone that may be um, subject to a, a cycle of violence um, may uh, present differently or um, what the uh, areas of concern might be if you're uh, if you're interacting with somebody who you're, you're trying to uh, assist that's in that uh, type of a crisis. And I think the the, the direction that we took in in receiving feedback uh, from from those folks was to be clear about the lanes and 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 the work, and that 
these individuals are not to take over uh, for those, those supports, uh, but to be able to help identify and appropriately refer uh, to those types of supports um, or to, to engage in emergent situations uh, around safety, but really not to uh, supplant or replace any of the uh, domestic violence supports that are, that are currently out there um, in the state. Sounds like you've found a good accommodation, perhaps for the change in statutory language. Yeah. Great. I think um, I think maybe we're at the point where it uh, makes sense for us to bring this to a close for the afternoon. Uh, again, thank you, Commissioner Sherling. Uh, this has been very informative, and uh, Deputy uh, Commissioner Fox. Um, and I, I have to say that you know you know. This is, a, this is an example, you know, like we work hard, we bring our different points of view together, uh, trying to move something forward as, as the legislature, and then we move forward with uh, turning it over to the executive branch to implement. And, uh, and uh, this, is, this is a very helpful update and, uh, and very hopeful update, given all that, all that uh, can happen here. So we look forward to staying, uh, staying apprised of, of this work and uh, look forward to hearing from you again at another point in time. Thanks for having us in. Thanks for the support. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. Um, so I think that brings us to a close for the day. We can go off YouTube.